Well, dear friends, after turning to the prophecy of Isaiah last Lord's Day, as we considered the sort of a patriotic theme on the 4th of July weekend when God sets his face against the nation, today we return to the book of Acts. We've been studying this for several months now. And we turn to Acts chapter 18. And I would invite you to turn there with me, if you would please. Acts chapter 18. If you are using one of the Maroon Bibles, this can be found in the New Testament on page 953. Page 953. Acts chapter 18. We will just be reading today the first 11 verses of Acts chapter 18. But I draw your special attention, dear friends, to verses 9 through 11 as verses 9 through 11 will constitute our text for today. Acts chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, let us hear then the word of the Lord. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, He shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. Many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word. And as always, dear friends, I ask and urge you to keep your Bibles open and handy as we look to God's word together on this Lord's Day. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, several years ago, the Camden, Maine Herald newspaper ran two photographs on the same page. One photograph was of the town council along with the town manager. And the other photograph was of a flock of sheep. Apparently, unintentionally, the captions under those photographs were switched. And under the photos of the sheep, it identified them from left to right as town officials. Under the photograph of the town fathers, the caption read, and I quote, the sheepfold, naive and vulnerable, they huddle for security against the uncertainties of the outside world, (laughs) end of quote. (laughs) Now think about that. Can you identify with that? Have you ever felt that way before? Afraid? Vulnerable, alone, discouraged, again, just, just fearful. I would suppose that all of us have felt that way at one time or another, or at least to one degree or another, and maybe some of us feel that way today. And friends, if we do, we are putting ourselves in the place of the Apostle Paul some 2,000 years ago, who undoubtedly was experiencing those very same kinds of feelings and emotions as well. For think about it. 
And our study of the book of Acts thus far, especially more recently, brothers and sisters, as we've been tracing Paul on his first and second missionary journeys, we discovered that Paul was stoned, dragged outside the city, and left for dead in the city of Lystra in Acts 14. Due to a sharp disagreement over whether to take John Mark along with them or not, he and Barnabas had such a strong disagreement that they parted ways. And we read about that in Acts 15. In Acts 16, we read that uh, Paul and Silas were flogged and imprisoned in Philippi. And then in Acts 17, we read that Paul and Silas had to flee to Thessalonica by night. Their lives were in danger. And in Acts 17, we also read that, that Paul enters the city of Athens, this, this uh, great Greek city where it was said that there were more gods in Athens than there were men, a Greek intellectual center. The home, by the way, of a great temple to the love goddess Aphrodite in the Greek, Venus for the Romans, with all of the accompanying cult prostitutes and the rest. And so Athens was an exceedingly wicked city. And here we find that uh, Paul enters Corinth, which was a similarly wicked city in the first century A.D. In fact, one commentator has said of Corinth, listen carefully, please. Corinth had a reputation for sexual license remarkable even in classical antiquity. In fact, as I'm thinking out loud, it wasn't Athens, it was Corinth where that, that, that cult temple was placed. And it made Corinth a, 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 a modern day Las Vegas, if you will. In fact, there was a proverbial expression in Paul's day. The proverbi proverbial expression said, to Corinthian eyes, or are you living like a Corinthian? And what that meant, personally and practically speaking, was that you were living a profligate, promiscuous, sexually immoral life. Now think about it. Look at the heading of our scripture reading for today. It says, in Corinth, in Corinth. It was into Corinth that the Apostle Paul now goes. It's interesting to read early on in the verses before our text, just to set a bit of the context. If you look at Acts 18, verse 1, it says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Just like our own John and Miriam just recently came from Italy, and they came to this country. Although they were not driven out by, by Claudius. But it says here that Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome, Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Why do you think Paul worked with Priscilla and Aquila at tent making? Well, apparently, perhaps, his missionary support had run out. And he had to engage in what missionaries and, and theologians now call tent making. He had to work to provide for his own hands. But the good news of the gospel tells us, if you're taking notes in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 8 and 9, that Timothy and Silas had come from Macedonia and brought him more financial support. And as a result, as our text goes on to teach us, uh, verse 3, uh, excuse me, verse 4, every day he reasoned, every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came, here's the, the additional support coming in for Paul from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. And brothers and sisters, that is a challenge. That is a reminder for us that we need to do all we can as stewards of the riches that God entrusts to us to help make sure that the missionaries of the Church of Christ have all of the financial, material uh, provision uh, that they could possibly need so that they can full-time engage in the work of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Timothy and Silas came from Macedonia. They brought some funds to Paul. He was able to devote himself now again exclusively to preaching. And the text continues, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul, verse uh, 6, and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And that is exactly what Paul did. In fact, if you would care to turn with me, please, several pages to the right. Let's go to the book of Romans, Acts Romans, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. I think it's page 966 in the, uh, in the Maroon Bible. Romans chapter 1, and drop down with me, please, in Romans 1 to verses 16 and 17. Here Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
because it is the power, it is the dunamis, it is the dynamite of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Notice, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. But friends, bring that information to bear uh, to the context of our text in Acts 18 and think of the fact that he was going to the Gentiles because the Jews re re rejected the message. And think about what we've studied thus far in the way that Paul was constantly being reviled, uh, he was being mocked, he was being maligned, he was being beaten, he was being abused, he was being imprisoned, and there was that time he was left for dead. And that was kind of, the, was kind of summary of the kind of, of, of persecution he was facing. And so is it any wonder, if you'll drop back in the words of our text with me in verses 7 and 8, that we read, well, here's some good news in the midst of it all. He leaves the synagogue and he goes next door to the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Christians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Okay, that, that's good news. But then why, in verse 9, does God appear to Paul miraculously, supernaturally, in a vision in the night, and say to him in verse 9, look at the text with me, do not be afraid. The word is phobeo, it's where we get our word phobia from. And it's an imperative, God is commanding Paul not to be afraid. And then a second imperative, keep on speaking. It's a command. Paul, keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Why would God say that to Paul? Why do you think he appears to him in a vision in the night supernaturally? Gives him twofold imperative. Do not be afraid and do not be silent. Well, I personally think it's probably because he was starting to be afraid. <laughs> I think he very well might have been tempted to be silent. And so God gave him that, that twofold command. I was reading a commentary by the late Dr. James Montgomery Boyce on this particular passage recently. And uh, Dr. Boyce had the same thought as I just shared with you. And he said, I, he said, I would suspect that Paul wasn't only considering uh, closing his mouth, but he might have also been considering changing his method. It didn't seem to be working very well for all of the persecution and the kind of response he was getting. In fact, Dr. Boyce writes, and I'm going to quote this to you now. He said, if he had been uh, ministering today and faced what he was facing there in, in uh, the uh, chapters of the book of Acts, Paul might have thought something along these lines, writes Dr. Boyce, and I'm quoting this to you now. I've been preaching and teaching. It's not bearing fruit. Perhaps I should seek out a different methodology. Liturgical dance, perhaps. Maybe I should get into popular music. A rock concert. Maybe I should go on television and have a talk show. <laughs> Something different has to be tried. I think that's why God appeared to Paul in a vision in the night. And he said, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. And brothers and sisters, that same twofold command that God gave to the Apostle Paul in a vision in the night 2,000 years ago, he is giving to us today as his followers by his word and by his spirit. Because considering the country we're living in, considering the culture we're living in, considering the way in which the word of God is increasingly being mocked and maligned and abused, when you read the headlines about the way our brothers and sisters in the Lord are being persecuted in their businesses simply for implementing their religious and moral biblical convictions as to the way they conduct their business, and you see all these, these things increasingly arising now, God is saying to you and He is saying to me, do not be afraid, do not be silent, keep on speaking. You know, just a few days ago, I had the privilege, um, I had lunch with Brother Nick in, in town here at Triplets. And uh, when we were departing, I said to Nick, hey, Nick, I want you to, to pray for me. As I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over to the Wilkins building, and I'm going to knock on some, some neighbors' doors and simply invite them to worship. And part of the reason I was burdened to do that, brothers and sisters, was because just a few weeks ago, there was a lady came in during the worship service. She sat, Dave, right in that empty chair next to you. You probably remember her coming in. And I thought it was your sister. I just, I just thought it was, you were sitting by Dave and Ellen. It's probably his sister. Well, she scooted out before I could, I could catch her to talk to her. 
And Linda told me afterward, because she had gone over to make sure she had a book and everything, she's just a neighbor, lives next door to the Wilkins building, and said she just decided to try a service and, and duck in. And as I shared with the brothers, Michael, at the Bible study, I, I can't get this out of my head that, that she was here. I didn't know who she was. I didn't speak with her. And I thought, man, we all need to be mindful of whoever comes through these doors in God's providence and welcome them and, and, and greet them and, and just love them in the name of the Lord. But anyway, so I, I go to knock on some doors. So I knocked on a door next door here and it was kind of banged up and closed up and, and nobody answered. Fine. I was hoping to just run into this, this girl. So I go across the street uh, to the house. I showed Margaret on the way in. It's the red house up on the hill across the street. Park on, on um, 209, walk up the long driveway, up the, all the stairs, way up to the house. Ring the bell, knocking, knocking. Finally, this guy comes to the door. And he's got a pit bull barking at his feet. <laughs> now, you know with what we just went through in our family, this is not something I wanted to, I wanted to deal with. But the guy stepped out on the porch. The dog stayed in the house. And he said, can I help you? So I said, yeah, hi, I'm Pastor Rich Kuka. You've probably seen our sign across at the Wilkins building. And he's looking at me with a blank stare. Apparently, I hadn't seen the sign. And I said, well, I'm actually trying to find a neighbor who ducked in a few weeks ago. Do you know, do you know a neighbor named Allison in this area? He goes, no. I said, well, listen, I'd, since I've got you here, I'd like to give you a, a card and invite you to worship and uh, offer my pastoral services to you. If there's any way I could be of service to you and your family. Well, he grabs a card, sticks it in his pocket. And as I'm talking, he's backing into the house. And I said, well, just a minute, what, what's your name? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and he shuts the door. There's probably a lot of people like that in our communities today. Pastor scares them to death. They don't want anything to do with the Bible. They don't want anything to do with the church. They don't want anything to do with a Christian. And they sure don't want to hear that Jesus is the only way of salvation. God is saying to you, He's saying to me today, do not be afraid. <laughs> Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. And then as we get to verse 10 of our text, that was a long introduction, I understand. <laughs> But as we get to verse 10 of our text, we find three key reasons as to why, just as was true for the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago, you and I can and must go forth into each new day as ambassadors for Christ, as witnesses for the cause and kingdom of Christ, clothed with courage. Clothed with courage. Look at the text with me, if you would, please. Here we learn, first of all, that reason number one is to why, like Paul, we can witness for Christ, clothed with courage, even against all the opposition we are facing in our country and our culture today, is because that we have been assured of God's presence. We have been assured of God's presence. Look at the text again with me, please. Verse 9, and we'll go into verse 10. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Why? Reason number one, verse 10, for I am with you, for I am with you. Friends, does that sound familiar to you, that kind of phraseology, terminology? Does, does it ring any biblical bells with you, as I like to say? It should. In fact, go, if you care to turn with me, if you want to just listen, that's okay. Let's go way back to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. It's page 166 in our Maroon Bible, Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. God is giving His law a second time, Deutero, second nomos law, second giving of His law, because the Israelites had rebelled against Him in not going up to possess the promised land. They died in the wilderness. Now Joshua is about to take them into the promised land. And in Deuteronomy 20, verse 1, page 166, God's Word says this, When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them. Because the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, notice, will be with you. He will be with you. Similarly, if you're in Deuteronomy with me, let's go to Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Here in similar fashion, God says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm using this in a context of spiritual warfare, but that's true for any of us in life. 
No matter what we're going, to, going through personally or professionally or uh, maritally or interpersonally or anyway, financially, uh, etc., God says, do not be afraid. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Now, similarly, let's go to the prophecy of Jeremiah, page 647 in the Maroon Bible, page 647. Prophecy of Jeremiah, the first chapter. And drop down with me, please, to verses 17 through 19. Jeremiah 1, page 647, 17 through 19. God is commissioning Jeremiah to minister to his captive people in Babylon, calling them to faith and repentance. And he says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, 17, page 647, Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. And then f finally, friends, on this score, in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, the, the, uh, Jesus speaking there, the Great Commission. At the end of that Great Commission, Jesus says to his disciples, And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And so when we bring that information to bear back on the words of our text in Acts chapter 18, we listen again by God's word and spirit to what he is saying to us today. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. You can be my witnesses, my ambassadors, clothed with courage. Why so? Well, first of all, because we too, like Paul, have been assured of God's presence. We've been assured of God's presence. Well, friends, a second reason that is given to us here in the words of our text as to why we can live each day clothed with courage, and that is because we, we go into this warfare wearing the armor of God's protection. We go forth wearing the armor of God's protection. For example, look at verse 10 once again with me, if you would please. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you. And now secondly, and no one is going to attack and harm you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Think about that, but do not misunderstand what we just read. This does not mean that Paul would never, ever again be persecuted in any way. In fact, if you want to drop down to the portion of Scripture just beyond our Scripture reading, look at verse 12, for example. While Galileo was pro of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. So he's hauled into court. And so his troubles weren't over. But notice also, similarly, that in God's providence, if you drop down to verse 16, uh, because uh, Galileo read this as a, a uniquely Jewish problem, uh, he sort of threw it out of court, and, and, and Paul didn't have to go through a trial or anything. Uh, so so that, was, that was sort of good news. But again, it does not mean he would never be persecuted for the cause of Christ, but it meant that God would always protect him as he was ministering for Christ. And that's that same thing God promises all of his people today. All those who are his, by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We have God's protection. In fact, one of my favorite psalms, and if you would care to turn with me, I invite you to do so. Back in the Old Testament, Psalm 91. Psalm 91. In the uh, Maroon Bible, it's page 512. I won't go into all the details because I think I shared this with you or I shared it at the men's Bible study or something. But way back in the early 90s, I, uh, I had a cousin that was a captain um, with, the, uh, with the U.S. Uh, Army. And he was commanding a tank battalion as we were trying to drive Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And he was going to be driving, uh, leading his tank brigade through uh, trenches in the sand filled with oil and that were lit on fire. It was a horrific uh, episode my, my cousin Captain Pete Kukin was going to be going through, along with all of our armed forces at that time. And he, he was in uh, Kuwait. He was, it was a Muslim country. He wasn't able to have a Bible. And so I wrote him a letter. He could get letters. And I started the letter, Dear Pete, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I wrote the whole psalm out in the letter. And he put that letter up in his helmet during that attack. And he and his men were kept uh, without a scratch, he told me. When he got back to Texas, he called me. He thanked me. And he said, the word of God is true. His promises are true. Here's God's promises to his people. Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. 
I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And friends, in very similar but much more succinct fashion, if you'll turn several pages to the left, if you're in Psalms with me, go to Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. And here in Psalm 23, David writes, The Lord is my shepherd. Notice, he doesn't say the Lord is simply a shepherd. He doesn't simply say that the Lord is the shepherd. He says the Lord is my shepherd. And that makes all the difference in time and for all eternity. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes or restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths, literally in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, literally the Hebrew says the valley of the shadow of death. It is a metaphor for the most terrible peril that any one of us could ever face in any, in any way or in any area of life. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love or mercy, the Hebrew word is chesed. It refers to God's covenantal love and faithfulness that he will not let his people go. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All glory be to God. All glory be to God. But friends, think think about this back in the context of the Apostle Paul. We could read all these promises of God, claim them by faith. But is it not true that Paul, according to church historians, was beheaded by the Roman Emperor Nero for the cause of Christ? Is it not true that according to church historians, the Apostle Peter was crucified upside down on a cross? Not considering himself worthy to be crucified right side up as was his Savior. What do we do with the reality that on January 8, 1956, five missionaries, Jim Elliott, Peter Fleming, Ed McCulley, Roger Udarian, and Nate Saint were murdered by the Alca Indians in Ecuador along the banks of the Curare River, serving the Lord, claiming His protection. And they were run through with spears. What do we make of that? (laughs) In similar situations like that. Well, those are fair questions. Those are difficult questions. They're important questions. And friends, I think an answer to those kinds of questions. The Lord Jesus gives us a great measure of encouragement and comfort by what he says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 verses 28 through 31. Page 836 in the Maroon Bible, Matthew 10, 28 through 31. Jesus says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. (laughs) Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. 
And so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And so, friends, it's true. God is saying to you and to me today by his word and spirit, the very same thing he said to Paul by way of a vision in the night 2,000 years ago. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Go forth clothed with courage. First of all, because we are assured of God's presence. And secondly, because we are clothed with the armor of God's protection. Now, there's a third and final reason in verse 10 of our text as to why we can live each day clothed with courage. And that is because we, too, like Paul, are being used to accomplish God's purposes. We, too, are being used to accomplish God's purposes. Let's do verses 9 and 10 one last time together. Look with me, please. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Why? Number one, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. I am with you. No one is going to attack and harm you. Number three, because I have many people in this city. Because I have many people in this city. My friends, some theologians have interpreted that portion of our text to mean that Corinth had all of these Christians who were going to rise up and protect Paul and nothing was going to happen to him. But when you understand what we said about Corinth, (laughs) Sin City... And the fact that 1 Corinthians 5 tells us that some of the most heinous sins in the culture had invaded themselves into the church. I strongly suspect that that's not what God meant. I have many people in this city and you don't need to be afraid. They're all going to rise up and protect you. I don't think so. I think what that portion of our text means is that God said, Paul, your work is not done because I have many people. The Greek word is laos. It's the word used in the Septuagint, the Old Testament translation, the Greek Old Testament translation of the Old Testament, when it's referenced to the set-apart people of God. God is saying, by my sovereign grace and electing love, I have many people in this city who still need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friends, that's part of the reason why Margaret and I came to Pennsylvania two years ago. In fact, some of you folks that were at Pompton at the time, the few of you, You may recall that when I shared with the congregation that Margaret and I were burdened to leave after 35 years and plant a church in PA, I led a devotional at the beginning of that meeting. And and the fellowship hall was packed. There were chairs everywhere. People were standing all around. These were the verses that I read. Because I knew that God has his people in East Stroudsburg, in Stroudsburg, in Hardyston, (laughs) in Oak Ridge, in Whitehaven, in Columbia, in Bangor. I'm getting to Susquehanna. (laughs) Sailorsburg, Henryville. (laughs) And everywhere in between. God said, I have many people in this city. Dr. A.J. Gordon, man that founded Gordon College and Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, once said this, though our task is not to bring all the world to Christ, our task is unquestionably to bring Christ to all the world. And God said, I have many people in this city. In fact, if you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to jot down Acts 13. And if you're there, you can turn there with me. Jot down Acts 13, verses 44 through 48. Acts 13, just several pages back to the left, 44 through 48. On the next Sabbath, it says, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. And Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48, look with me please. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, notice, and all, not a single one was accepted, 
who were appointed, the King James translates it, I think, ordained. It's perfect tense in the Greek. You say so. Well, what that means is that it's referring to a one-time past action that God has taken with an ongoing enduring effect that cannot be changed. And so, think about this. The Gentiles heard this. They were, they were glad, and all who were appointed to eternal life believed. And all who were appointed to eternal life believed. Glory be to God. And that is why after God says to Paul, because I have many people in this city, verse 11 of our text, so, or therefore, Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Precisely what you and I are called to do here each and every day, clothed with courage, because we too are being used to accomplish God's purposes, to accomplish God's purposes. You know, friends, I was reading recently that in the olden days, when the great ships were sailing the high seas and engaging in combat, engaging in warfare, that some captains would order their crew to nail their colors, to nail their their flag to the mast as an irrefutable testimony of the fact that no matter what happened and no matter what dangers they faced, no matter how fiercely the battle would rage, They were not going to surrender. They were not going to surrender. And similarly, my dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, as you and I leave this place, by God's grace, let us also, as it were, nail our colors to the mast. And having been reminded by God's Holy Spirit-inspired word that we have been assured of God's presence, that we are clothed with the the armor of God's power and that we are being used to accomplish His purposes. Let us go forth into this new week and live our lives under His Lordship each and every day, clothed with courage. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. O Lord our God, As the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, his young son in the faith so many years ago, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of dunamis, of dynamite, of love, and of self-discipline. And Lord, because that is true, we say and we pray Just as we sang a short time ago, since I must fight, if I would reign, increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Hear us, Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.